Welcome to the show. My name is Braden Gall, and that is Teron Davenport from ESPN joining us here on both Lamestream Sports and a football show brought to you by Eighth and Roast, Sinkers Beverages, and the Kingston Group. Teron, thank you so much for giving us some time, man. How are you, dude? Yeah, I'm doing really well, man. Appreciate you. So I guess we'll call it summer camp is over uh, for the Tennessee Titans. We're going to have a little break here before training camp opens and all hell breaks loose for, for everybody's life for like the next nine months. But but I'm but there's so much new to this team. You got uh, obviously Rand Carthon's been around, but his front office has changed. The structure has changed. The the coaching staff is completely different. Mostly, most of the roster is completely different. So, take us through the beginning of camp when rookies are re- are sort of reporting, and your job is to get to know all this stuff. W- what is your approach to a team? You've been on the beat for a while, but that is so completely new. How did you go into this summer camp session? in terms of what you wanted to accomplish from a goal standpoint? Well, yeah, fortunately, every year you got a new rookie class that's coming in, so you can kind of use the same approach. Except for this year, it was a matter of this being the first time you see these coaches get their hands on the players and work with them. So you're just looking for patterns. You're looking for styles as far as how they go about teaching, how they go about bringing these guys along. That's really the main thing that, that I look for. And just like you're looking to establish relationships with the rookie players, you're looking to do that with the coaches. I feel that the PR staff did a good job of making the assistant coaches available early in the process. So that way you could talk to them and then you see them out there and made some pretty good connections with them. So initially that's what it is. It's, it's all about, you know, making them see that you're going to be fair and thorough with, with how you cover the team and, just getting to know them. It, how, how do you, so obviously there's a whole, whole different air to the building, right? That's what everybody said right away after Vrabel was sort of gone and all the new pieces are in place and everybody's lighter and feeling good. And, you know, to your point, the PR, like the, the coaching staff itself is far more willing to be articulate and explain things, which is really, really interesting if you're a fan, but also a media member. How do you go about, I know games are the only real way you can figure it out, but how do you go about, deciphering if any of that stuff is going to be productive or not? Or are you still just guessing until we get games? I mean, you could tell early if there's going to be a difference as far as like how the coaching staff is going to share information and stuff like that. So really it's just you're shooting your shot. You're you're seeing, you know, how they're going to respond to certain questions you ask. And uh, that's the best way to do it is, you know, that's how you find out. You know, you ask the question and you, you look at uh, one of the things that Brian Callahan did early was talk about the huddle and how they're going to have the huddle set up. You know, you probably wouldn't have got that information from the previous staff and that's fine, but it's just it's an example of the difference. Well, I want to, I want to go a little further into that because I think Vrabel was, was famously a certain way at press conferences and with the media after games, et cetera. And also very different when he was with his players and in the locker room and on the practice f- field do you think that Brian Callahan is is basically being himself at press conferences? Do you think that he's just he just kind of is what he is? Yeah, I think he's being himself. I don't think he has any reason not to be. And look, I know people have had issues with how positive he's been, but it, you know, you don't come in and and just be all, you know, <laughs> hell is 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 happening, and you know we're going to have nothing but negativity. Like you go in with a positive mindset, with a give everybody a blank slate and allow them an opportunity to paint their own picture, so to speak. And I think that's what he's done, right? And he's found some positive things and he's highlighted that. And I think, you know, the interaction with us as the media has has been good so far. I know there's some, you know, disagreements with how the players are available and things like that. But look, I think he's being himself 100%, and I don't believe that it's all positive with him. I know from talking to people in Cincinnati that, you know, there were times where he had to, you know, jump on some folks, and he did it. So I think he's capable of that, and I think, yeah, absolutely, he's being himself. Do you think that that difference is over between Vrabel and Callahan, do you think that difference is overplayed a bit? I think there's a lot of talk that – Near the end, Vrabel was a certain way. He was the disciplinary and the old school Junction Boys guy. But like, really, a lot of players said that he was really great from a communication standpoint, one on one. And it feels like a lot of people are branding Brian Callahan, to your point, as sort of like this nice guy who just kind of softer spoken and 
But like I, I've heard stories like you have that that's not always the case. Do you think they're actually more alike than what it appears to be, or is, am I just making that up? I don't. I think there's just too much of an emphasis on it. Mike Vrabel is Mike Vrabel, and Brian Callahan is Brian Callahan, and I think really you got to allow each of those guys to be themselves and accept the fact that they are different and it's not going to be the same. And that's fine. That does not to say that one is better than the other. It's just, they're two different ways of, uh, of doing things. And it's pretty much that. Do you, uh, all right. This is a little bit different, but do you think that because players and I'm not trying to be the old guy here, who's like, look at these young guys who are all soft or whatever, but like I'm raising two daughters. I know you got kids. Like we want the next generation to always be more evolved than, than the one that we are. And do you think that we've reached a point where players are now permanently different coming out of college than they were 20 years ago in terms of psychological evaluation or, or evolution and that you do need a more evolved approach in 2024? Yeah, I think you do need a more evolved approach. And I think, you know, players are more empowered. I think that's really the situation that – separation of coach and player is not the same as far as like i don't want to say parent and child but like like boss employee <laughs> it's, it's it's not the same as it was before where you had your bill belichick your bill parcells and those types where it's like hey look man this is the way you do it if not there's a door it's not totally that way now players have more power so yeah you do have to manage them differently and when you're winning that dictator style is is good but once you start losing as you've seen here it, it doesn't it doesn't work because that's when the wear and tear starts to happen as far as psychologically uh the winning isn't a makeup to for what the, they're going through uh who is going to be the most interesting coach on the staff and why is it denard wilson yeah i mean i think it's just the energy that he brings he always has some type of saying, whether it's obnoxious communication, attacking the ball with violence, all these types of things. And he just has a way of like he captures you when when he speaks. And then, you know, any coach that comes to practice and all black with the black Air Forces one <laughs> Air Force ones and has the defense playing the way that they did on that Wednesday, you know, you gotta love it. So yeah, I, I mean it's it's a matter of time. I think his his time here is limited. He's going to eventually move on to to be a, a head coach somewhere. And it's, you know, it's one of those things where you have a, a unit that's really good. And I think they're going to eventually be really good. And it's going to lead to him moving on. Did you have any experience covering him or being around him or no. until he got his job? So that's your first time. Like you, you've yeah. picked up on you've picked up on his ability to be a head coach based on a couple of like a month and a half of being around him. Yeah, you could tell. And then it's not just being around him, it's talking to players, right? And you could tell the way they react to him and how there's just a, a connection that he seems to make with guys. And it's not just the DBs, right? You talk to Arden Key and he'll, he'll tell you. You talk to, you know, a bunch of guys, man. Like I said, the DBs. You, you talk to, uh, the, you know, the linebackers. They'll tell you. And, and it's not just like, a certain type of player. It's it's all of the players. Like they connect. What did you learn through this five weeks of practice, rookies, camp, OTAs, etc.? What 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 have you learned about the the new organization, the new Tennessee Titans? I learned that the talk of being aggressive at the line of scrimmage from a DP perspective, it wasn't just talk. It was actual that's that's the vibe. That's the action. That's what's going to happen. That's one of the things I learned. I learned that they'll be creative in their ways to attack the quarterback. Saw some things that that stood out. We obviously can't discuss scheme, but I saw some things that say, you know, yeah, they've been in a lab and they're going to come up with some ways to, to go after the passer. So uh, that's something I learned. Uh, I learned that Gabe Judy Lolly is is a pretty impressive player. At least for now, you know, we'll see what happens when they put the pads on. How, how many of those, like how, there's certainly guys that I saw at practice that I'm like, oh, you look different than last year. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you look, do, do you keep like a running catalog? Do you have notes about every player? Like how, is it all just in your brain where you, you've been out there so many times that you sort of recognize when a guy's doing something different? Like how can you see progress and development 
it, like what's your what's your strategy for sort of evaluating that? Yeah, I mean, you could just watch. You could tell when a guy's moving faster than than he was, or a guy is bigger. You look at Rashad Weaver. You know, he's someone you could tell like he's kind of leaned out and his body looks a little more explosive. He spoke on it. Um, you could look at some of the other guys. Uh, no one else comes to mind. Inst uh, Harold Landry, you know, you, you look at him and he looks a little bit more bulky uh, up top. And you could tell, like, OK, he put some work in, especially on the upper part of his body. And uh, you, you could just you see it from having watched these guys for so long. You, you have their mannerisms and just their movements down pat. And then you could kind of see when that either intensifies or decreases. So I. I would argue that a lot of last year's draft class came into this session, this summer session, uh, like feeling more like adult professional football players, which mm -hmm. is a great, which is a great thing for those players and for Titans fans and for the coaching staff, frankly. Yeah. Um, how do you balance? And Brian Callahan spoke to this at the beginning of session, like, Hey, these young guys are trying to learn how to be professionals. So how do you tell the story of a, a player who's like got a ton of ability, clearly a ton of upside and talent, but like has to learn to be a professional, but also in a league where like, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And, and it's it, NFL, not for long. Like, how do you balance, you know, that, that, that needed time to develop into a professional, which we're seeing with Josh Wiley, let's say versus, Hey, this is a league where if you can't cut it, man, the leash is short for everybody. Yeah, I think it's you avoid instant evaluations. And I mean, we saw one recently with a guy that's entering year three with, with Traylon Burks, you know, and Trevor Maddich, you know, I respect him and he has a very keen eye. But to say that he should be cut after one practice that wasn't admittedly wasn't the best practice of his. You can't have a rash to judgment like that. Like you have to understand that things are a process. So I think it's always balancing that. You know, uh, Cedric Gray is a good example. We watch him at North Carolina, and you see a guy that's all over the place, making every tackle, doing everything, and you're like, I haven't seen him do anything in OTAs and minicamp. But you also have to understand, okay, not only is he trying to figure out where he's supposed to be, they got him calling the defense too when he's out there. Just to know where everyone else is, it's kind of hard to, to play as fast as he did in college when everything is new and you're thinking about all these different things, naturally it's going to be a process. So I think you, you have to look at that. And then just like anything else, the more you wrap it, the better you get. And so it's early in the process and you just have to understand that. So Titans fans, and I think this is not unique to Titans fans. It's unique to every, I mean, the Jets fans are going through all this, who is there, who's not there. Like mm -hmm. it, it, it's very overblown in my opinion, but at the same time, every rep is very important, in particular for a player like Devondre Sweat. So how do you balance, telling again, the balance of telling the story, hey, these are important reps that he may or may not be missing because we don't see what happens when we're not around. We've seen a couple of videos where he was out there uh, when we weren't around. But so what? what is the what, what, what's your message to Titans fans who come to you and say, hey, man, I'm, I'm a little worried that the guy didn't participate in a single drill the entire time. Like, what, what do you what do you say to that person? Well, yeah, it's simple. Everything that happens now isn't as good as you think it is or as bad as you think it is. And in the case of Tavondre Sweat, yeah, I mean, you would love for him to be out there because, as I've said before, some people, I believe everybody learns best by doing. So if he's out there executing, even if it's not full speed with helmets on, if he's out there executing what it is he's learning and seeing in the meeting rooms, I think he's going to learn it better. But that's not to say that there's not time for that to, to happen. And it's not to say that learning in the classroom is going to hurt him. Yeah. He's going to, I think he's going to be fine from that perspective. Now, whatever it is that he's dealing with, that's something that I, I think you want to make sure that that doesn't balloon into a bigger issue. Right. And, you look at the way he is. I mean, this is a 300 and I don't know what he is now. Three. He came here 360, right? This is a guy that's that big. So if something is off on one side and you're compensating and trying to, you, you know, adjust for that, you're going to end up hurting something else. So just get it fixed right now and then go ahead and, and, and get ready for 
for training camp. Uh, what, what is the one thing after f- four or five weeks of watching this team, what's the thing that you didn't expect that you're most excited about? And what's the thing that you are the most concerned about? Mm, I think the most concerned thing would probably be What's the thing that I'm most? I mean, that's tough. Hey, if I if I stumped you, I feel great about this. <laughs> no, I, I think the thing most concerned about would probably be who's going to emerge. Who's going to emerge beyond Spears and, and Pollard? That's probably. The thing most well, actually, no, no. That's that's a that's a simple answer. The the right side of the offensive line. How is that going to end up looking? Competition is always good, and there's you know five to six guys that are competing for those right guard and right tackle spots. But where has Jalen Duncan been, right? And Nicholas Petit Ferrer. I know there's something he's working through. And it's another case of, hey, get it done now so you don't have to deal with it, you know. But I think what's going to come of the the right side, that's the biggest concern. Um, Most comfortable or most excited, I think it's it's the depth at at defensive back. Gabe Judy Lolly has emerged as a guy like, hey, you know, he's going to be in a rotation. And Jarvis Brownlee Jr., I liked him a lot coming in and, and watching him just adjust to the speed. I think he's going to be something, too. They're going to be pretty deep at, at DB. Uh, we talked about the evolution of the coach, but the evolution of the rest of the organization. Um, you got analytics being a bigger part of this whole thing. You got stretching is now, you know, uh, the strength and conditioning is a much larger staff. Is the rest of the organization evolved as well, in your opinion? Is that is, is, is all that talk about that part of the organization valid, in your opinion? Yeah, I think they have made strides to move forward into uh, – a more modern approach to things and you're seeing it, right? The extensive stretch before practice, uh, as you mentioned, the addition to the strength and conditioning step, analytics, all of that. And then they shuffle things around organizationally. It's just as far as like how roles are defined and things like that. So yeah, I would say they're moving on. All right. I want to ask about the the press court here for a second. And I, I I'm curious because I think you've been around a couple of other ones, but how do you personally feel about the diversity of the group of people covering the Tennessee Titans, be it male, female, black, white, background? How do you feel about it? Yeah, I think it, especially over the years, it has definitely evolved uh, over the time that I've been here. I think there's a, a good representation. Um, as good as a lot of places, uh, actually even better, you know, in my opinion. So, yeah, I think it's, there's an assortment of, of ethnicities, um, male, female, everything. It's, it's good. I mean, that's that's my takeaway is that I look around and I go, there's a lot of different types of people here doing good work covering the Titans. That That's mm-hmm. how I felt, feel about it, at least. So Yeah. Um, all right. So last one here, and we'll let you go. Uh, you've been very gracious with your time. I do appreciate it. And uh, you were on with us last time, and – you know, I think you were telling us about when you got the call from ESPN mm-hmm. to get the job, I believe, and you got pretty emotional about it. Uh, yeah. you had a you had a public I- incident that took place that that went public in the spring, kind of in the off season. Uh, and I'm a big believer that that people are not their best decision, they're not their worst decision. We're all just a bunch of decisions wound together over time. And I'm I'm curious. It led you to be away from the beat for a little while. Can you? kind of take us through what's going through your head during that time. And you maybe don't know what the future holds for you uh, with this thing that you work so hard to acquire. Can you kind of take us through the human side of all that? Yeah. I mean, look, I had a DUI, right. I had too much to drink and, you know, I, I felt the best thing to do was to try to sleep it off and Hey, things happen. Right. And it was a bad decision, a series of bad decisions. I'll take ownership. So, you know, everybody on X that wants to pass judgment and do all that, keep shooting your shot. You know, wolves don't concern themselves with the opinion of sheep. So you can say what you want. I'm not going to care. But as far as what's going on at that time is, hey, I mean, I'm wondering if everything that, that I worked hard for was, you know, pissed away because of 
very bad actions. And I'm thinking, okay, how am I going to work through this legal situation? You know, how am I going to be able to, you know, maintain my job and, and just figure things out? And, you know, in the process of that, you're also like, hey, look, man, I know what's right for me. I know what's wrong for me. I've been, you, you know, alcohol free for 169 days and I can t plan to continue to, to stack those days like that. And it's just one of those things where it was a, a wake up call. Sometimes things happen to slow you down. And that's essentially what happened with me. Right. It, it says slow, you, slow yourself down like you're doing too much. And hey, I mean, fortunately, you know, it was something I was able to keep my job. You know, uh, the legal situation has has been resolved. And, you know, obviously, like I say, you know, every once in a while, uh, it's going to come up because people have nothing better to do than, you know, relish in someone else's mistakes, despite the fact that they make many themselves. And it's it's just going to it's going to trail me. It's going to it's going to be there. And it's just one of those things where, like I said, it's I'm moving forward, right? And you know, the the rear view mirror is this big, the windshield is this big. So I'm focused on what's in front of me. And I, I won't forget the things that, that happen. It's a lesson. I'm not ashamed of it. It's it's what I've learned is to use it as your biggest weapon. And it's something to think about if any of these similar bad decisions come about in the future, you remember the consequences, and that's going to keep you from making the bad decisions again. So that's that. Well, keep keep stacking days. And uh, I think the Titans beat is significantly better when you're on it. So thank you for giving us some time. We do appreciate it. And uh, obviously t enjoy like the next couple of weeks, just like relax mm -hmm. a little bit uh, yeah. before, before everything goes crazy when, when camp shows up. So thank you, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Appreciate it.